MRI of the wrist, the basics. So in this talk, I'll be uh, discussing how to approach reading a wrist MRI and also what to look for in terms of pathology and common uh, normal variants of anatomy that can be confusing for pathology. So first, we're going to discuss how uh, to approach reading a wrist MRI. The most important thing uh, is uh, to use a checklist. So uh, we'll, this checklist will include the most common uh, structures that are routinely evaluated on every wrist MRI. And these include the bones, the joints, the triangular fibrocartilage complex, or the TFCC, ligaments, tendons, and other things such as the carpal tunnel, Guyane's canal, and masses. Here's a table that uh, lists the different pulse sequences that are typically acquired uh, with a wrist MRI and the imaging planes uh, that they're acquired in, and what I find most useful when I'm evaluating each of these structures. So as you can see here, uh, for most of the structures, the most useful pulse sequence is a fat-saturated, T2-weighted, or fluid-sensitive sequence, and the most common imaging plane uh, that's used in most of these is a coronal imaging plane. So if you had one sequence uh, and only one sequence, the coronal fat-saturated T2-weighted sequence or fluid-sensitive sequence is your most useful sequence when evaluating uh, a wrist MRI. So let's talk about uh, pathology. What are we looking for? And also uh, a brief description of some of the uh, important anatomy and the normal variants. So first we'll start with bone injuries. MRI is very uh, good for looking at fractures as well as bone contusions. And uh, it, it is uh, uh, good not only for looking for acute fractures, but also stress fractures, but particularly useful for looking for radiographically occult fractures. So one of the most common uh, fractures that MRI is used for is the scaphoid fracture. It is the most common carpal fracture, accounting for 70% uh, of all carpal fractures. It's usually uh, a result of a fall on an outstretched hand or a foosh injury and can be occult often on radiographs, and missed fractures can lead to avascular necrosis. MRI is uh, very accurate for identifying scaphoid fractures uh, with greater than 90% accuracy uh, reported. Here's a case of a scaphoid fracture in a 23-year-old female who fell snowboarding three months before the MRI. And here you can see that there's bone marrow edema on the T1-weighted image on the uh, left and the T2-weighted image on the right. Uh, and you can also see a low linear uh, T1 and T2 signal line through the waist of the scaphoid consistent with the fracture line. And this is really the key way to differentiate a bone contusion from a fracture, and that is to look for this fracture line. A hook of the handmade fracture is another uh, occult fracture that can happen in the wrist where MRI can be particularly useful. It's much less common than scaphoid fractures, only accounting for about 2 to 4% of all carpal fractures. It's more common in athletes, especially those who play sports that involve uh, handling bats, clubs, or rackets, as it results from the handle of the batter uh, club striking the hypothenar eminence and fracturing the hook of the hammy. And like I said, these can be radiographically occult, and that's where MRI can be especially useful. Here's a case of a hook of the handmade fracture in a professional baseball player who injured his hand while batting and fouling off a pitch. We can see here nicely uh, a uh, disruption of the uh, hook of the handmade at its base, both on the T1-weighted image on the left, as well as the T2-weighted image on the right. Avascular necrosis is another uh, important diagnosis uh, where MRI can be very useful. Um, MRI uh, findings of avascular necrosis, the most specific are really low T1-weighted and low T2-weighted signal, uh, as well as, uh, in more advanced cases, looking for articular surface collapse. The most common locations for avascular necrosis include the proximal pole of the scaphoid, usually as a result of a scaphoid waist fracture, uh, as well as uh, AVN of the lunate, also known as Kindbox disease, which is usually the result of ulnar negative variants or a short ulna. Here's a case of scaphoid avascular necrosis. You can see the uh, low T1 and T2 signal in the proximal pole of the scaphoid, and you can also see 
uh, a, a linear uh, low T2 signal here through the waist of the scaphoid uh, consisting of the fracture line. Here's a case of lunate avian or Kienbox disease. Again, we see the low T1 and T2 signal in the lunate, but in this case, we also see a little bit of articular surface collapse of the lunate at its articulation with the capitate. MRI can also be very useful for evaluating the wrist joints. Uh, these include the uh, articulation between the distal radius and ulna, uh, no, also known as the distal radial ulnar joint or the drudge the radiocarpal and ulnocarpal joints, the articulations between the distal radius and the carpal bones and the distal ulna and the carpal bones, respectively, as well as the articulation between the carpal bones or the mid-carpal joints. The joint disorders uh, that we typically evaluate for uh, most commonly are things like degenerative arthritis or degenerative joint disease inflam and inflammatory arthritis, as well as uh, disorders in alignment that can cause... Um, joint disorders such as a slack wrist or ulnar impaction. Uh, in terms of a slack wrist, which is scapholunate advanced collapse, the MRI features uh, consist of a scapho scapholunate ligament tear, as shown here, with widening of the space between the scaphoid and lunate, and subsequent development of degenerative uh, changes between the scaphoid and distal radius here, and proximal migration of the capitate through this widened scapholunate space. This can also be associated with a DISI deformity or a dorsal intercalated segmental instability where you have a dorsal tilt of the lunate. So normally the lunate should be aligned with the distal radius and the capitate, but as in this case, you can see that the uh, lunate is actually tilted dorsally uh, relative to its normal position. Another uh, um, abnormality of joint alignment that can be seen on uh, wrist MRI is ulnar impaction, also known as ulnar abutment. And this results from a ulnar positive variance or a long ulna, as can be seen here, where the ulna is longer than the distal radial uh, articular surface. As a result, you can have cystic, the ulna can abut the lunate resulting in cystic changes in the ulnar aspect of the lunate or sclerosis. And when it progresses, it can result in degenerative arthritis both at the ulnocarpal joint as well as the distal radial ulnar joint, as in this case. On MRI, we see similar findings. In a, um, early in the disease, what we see is degeneration of the triangular fibrocartilage uh, that lies in between these structures, as well as chondral loss in the distal ulna and lunate, uh, as seen in this case with edema here in the lunate. In more advanced cases, there can be a uh, tear of the TFC, uh, as shown here, uh, with development uh, and also a tear of the lunotriquetral ligament and development of degenerative arthritis of the ulnocarpal, uh, as well as the distal radial ulnar joints. MRI can be uh, very helpful in evaluating for disorders of the triangular fibrocartilage complex, or the TFCC. It's really the modality of choice to evaluate this structure. Uh, the TFCC uh, consists of uh, several components. Uh, the main component that we're going to focus on in this talk is the actual triangular fibrocartilage here, shown in blue. Uh, there are also the dorsal and volar radial ulnar ligaments, which lie on either side, both dorsally and volarly, to the triangular fibrocartilage, as well as the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon sheath, the ulnar collateral ligament, and the meniscus homolog. The function of the TFCC is to absorb the ulnar-sided axial loading forces, as well as to stabilize the ulnar side of the wrist and the distal radial ulnar joint. Just a quick uh, anatomy of the TFC, as this is important in order to be able to identify what's pathology and what's normal. The uh, TFC, the disc itself, is a fibrocartilaginous disc that's biconcave in shape. A normal disc should be low in signal on all pulse sequences, similar to the meniscus of the knee. Uh, 
It has a radial-sided attachment that attaches to the distal radial articular cartilage and can be, therefore, high in signal and should not be mistaken as a tear. It has two ulnar-sided attachments, first to the ulnar styloid, as shown here, and another attachment to the ulnar fovea, as shown here. In between these attachments, there's a high signal area referred to as the ligamentum subcurrentum, which essentially composes of, it's composed of fibrovascular tissue. And again, this is a normal appearance and shouldn't be mistaken as a tear. Here's a case of a radial-sided tear of the triangular fibrocartilage. The image on the left shows the tear through uh, where there's high signal separating the normal uh, low signal uh, fibers of the TFC. And this should be um, different from the normal where you see the high signal at the radial attachment, which is not a tear. So pay attention to the location uh, if you're going to call a radial side a TFC tear to make sure that you're not just calling uh, the tear at its radial attachment where normally there should be high signal. MRI uh, has shown to have a high accuracy for detecting TFC tears. Uh, and the radial sided tears uh, are more likely, are less likely to heal and more likely to require surgery. The, the triangular fiber cartilage can also tear from its ulnar sided attachments, and this is referred to as a peripheral TFC tear as shown in this image on the left, where we can see um, there's discontinuity of those uh, peripheral attachments to the ulnar styloid and the ulnar fovea, as we see uh, on the normal example on the right. And again, uh, note, note is made that you shouldn't call that high signal between the attachments as a tear. You really should not see those attachments at all uh, in order to uh, call this a tear. Now, peripheral-sided tears compared to radial-sided tears are much more difficult to diagnose, and arthrography uh, can be helpful. The uh, fortunate thing with these tears, however, is that there's more, these are more vascular, more, they're well vascularized in this area, and therefore more likely to heal. Another type of tear that's commonly seen, especially in older patients, is a degenerative uh, tear of the triangular fibrocartilage as seen in this case, where there's really attenuation uh, and absence of the normal uh, body and radial side of the uh, TFC as can be uh, as seen on the normal. And this attrition of the TFC is very common in older patients and is often asymptomatic. So we need to be careful uh, when diagnosing these and attributing them to pain because often this, this may not be the source of their pain. MRI can also be uh, very helpful to evaluate the uh, ligaments around the wrist, and these are really composed of the intrinsic ligaments, which are primarily the scapholunate and the lunotriquetral ligaments, as well as the extrinsic ligaments, which are located both dorsal and volar aspects of the wrist. The scapholunate ligament is, is one of the um, most important ligaments that we routinely evaluate on a wrist MRI. And uh, it's composed of three uh, different uh, components. It has a dorsal component, which is kind of band-like in, in uh, structure and has a striated appearance. It has a central component, which is more triangular in appearance uh, and can often normally be high in signal uh, and shouldn't be overcalled as a tear. And it has a volar component, which is more trapezoidal in appearance. The dorsal portion of the scaphoalunate ligament is the most important in terms of maintaining stability of the joint, and it can be uh, well seen also on the axial images uh, as shown uh, on this figure. MRI is uh, reported to be highly accurate in detecting these tears, and MR arthrography can be helpful in diagnosing uh, the more difficult cases. Scaphoalunate tears are uh, associated with uh, DISI deformities, uh, and slack wrist, as we uh, discussed earlier. Here's a case of a 40-year-old male uh, with wrist pain after a fall that had a scaphoalunate tear seen on this arthrogram. You can see uh, the uh, tear here uh, where you normally expect to see the scaphoalunate ligament on the coronal images, 
as well as a disruption of the dorsal band of the scapholunate ligament on the uh, axial images. And you can also see the uh, contrast extending between the scaphoid on the lunate uh, into the mid-carpal row on this arthrogram. Lunar triquetral tears are harder to diagnose than scaphoid tears, mainly due to their smaller, the smaller size of the ligament. And MR arthrography can be especially helpful in trying to diagnose these tears. Um, lunar triquetral tears are often associated with uh, triangular fibrocartilage tears uh, and can also result in instability to the wrist, resulting in a visi deformity or volar intercalated segmental instability, where there's now volar tilt of the lunate. Here's a case of a 24-year-old male with ulnar-sided wrist pain uh, showing a lunar triquetral tear. Uh, and uh, the image on the right uh, shows the normal appearance of the lunar triquetral ligament for comparison. And on the orthographic image, we can actually see very nicely the contrast extending between the lunate and the triquetrum. MRI can also be helpful in diagnosing tendon pathology. And in the wrist, the tendons can essentially be separated into extensor tendons and flexor tendons. And the extensor tendons are in six unique compartments that are uh, separated anatomically, as depicted here uh, at the level of the distal radius. Uh, an important landmark here uh, in identifying these tendons can, is, is Lister's tubercle, which separates the second extensor compartment from the third extensor compartment. The flexor tendons, on the other hand, are located uh, on the volar aspect of the wrist within the carpal tunnel, as shown here. Uh, there's only one uh, flexor tendon that does not run within the carpal tunnel, and that's the flexor carpi radialis here uh, to the radial aspect of the carpal tunnel. Tendon abnormalities essentially consist of tendinosis, uh, which on MRI appears as a thickened tendon that's increased in signal, as shown here in the extensor carpi ulnaris within the sixth extensor compartment of the wrist. It can result in a tendon tear here, again, in the extensor carpi ulnaris, where now there's fluid intensity and discontinuity of the tendon. And in the same case, you can actually see the torn retracted tendon more proximally in the distal forearm. And lastly, you can have tenosynovitis, where the tendon itself is normal in signal and morphology, but you may have fluid or synovitis within the tendon sheath surrounding the tendon, as in this case within the carpal tunnel. Decker-Veins syndrome or Decker-Veins tenosynovitis is a particularly common entity that one uh, encounters when uh, imaging the wrist. And this results in a, uh, this is secondary to an entrapment and irritation of the tendons of the first extensor compartment. This is usually a clinical diagnosis, but can be uh, diagnosed on MRI uh, as well. On MRI, uh, what we look for in this case is essentially uh, abnormalities involving the first extensor compartment uh, that can be either uh, result in low or high signal around the tendons, essentially tenosynovitis, as well as um, signal abnormality and or thickening of the tendons, uh, in other words, tendinosis. The major nerves of the uh, wrist should also be evaluated on every wrist MRI, and this, this includes the median nerve, uh, which is located within the carpal tunnel along its radial and volar or superficial aspect, as shown here. And the most common abnormality of the median nerve is the carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, this is usually a clinical diagnosis, and in most cases, MRI is not indicated. But MRI can be helpful if there's concern for a mass uh, in, uh, causing extrinsic or intrinsic compression of the nerve, as well as in patients who've had carpal tunnel surgery and are continuing to have persistent symptoms to look for um, scar tissue uh, and other abnormalities. The ulnar nerve, on the other hand, also lies within a uh, fibrooseous tunnel referred to as Guyon's Canal, which is bordered by the hypothenar muscles, the flexor retinaculum, and either the hook of the hamate or the pisiform, depending on the level. As a result of this tight space, 
uh, there can be uh, pathology associated uh, as a result of any of the uh, bordering structures, and the most common of which is uh, fractures of the hook of the hamate, which can result in ulnar nerve abnormalities. Another common indication for wrist MRI is to identify and characterize soft tissue masses around the wrist. The most common soft tissue masses one encounters in the wrist are ganglion cysts uh, and giant cell tumors and nerve sheet tumors. Ganglion cysts are by far the most common soft tissue mass in the wrist. They have characteristic locations, uh, which, should, which you should familiarize yourself with, uh, as, as this case here, in the dorsal aspect of the wrist near the uh, scapholunate uh, in, interval. Giant cell tumors, on the other hand, uh, rather than being cyst-like and high in signal, tend to be low in signal on all pulse sequences, as shown here. IV contrast can be helpful in these situations when evaluating soft tissue masses to distinguish a solid from a cystic mass. So in this uh, brief overview of wrist MRI, um, I covered the uh, approach to how to read a wrist MRI and discussed uh, some of the uh, common uh, relevant anatomic variants as well as pathology that one uh, encounters when reading these examinations. In terms of the keys to uh, successful reading a wrist MRI, I think it's important to learn the uh, anatomy of the wrist as well as important uh, normal variants and uh, be familiar with the uh, common disease processes that happen around the wrist so you can recognize them. Lastly, uh, it's helpful to use a checklist uh, to make sure that you remember to evaluate all the uh, necessary structures. Thank you.